Good evening, everyone. This is Heather Turner, the District 53 Social Media Chair, and this is the last in our series of social media for Toastmasters. The other, other recordings can be found on the District 53 website under webinars. We are recording this, and hopefully it will be posted on the D53 site within a few days, if not next week, because I know we're going into the weekend. And if you have questions, please ask them in the question bar to the right of your screen, and I would be happy to try to answer them as best I can near the end of the webinar. So LinkedIn groups are kind of a, an interesting character, if you want to call it that, because not a lot of groups work well for Toastmasters groups themselves. Facebook groups work much better. Facebook pages work even better, and there are many other social media channels. But we are going to go through how to start a Toastmaster group if your club decides to go into that. Or, and or, we will also be talking about leveraging LinkedIn and using it for advertising your Toastmasters group and members and Toastmasters International in general, which honestly I think is a lot more interesting than just the groups themselves, but we will get to that. Now, when you are logged into LinkedIn for the first time, and they've actually moved this, LinkedIn has been adjusting things fairly recently. And unlike a lot of other social media channels, they don't move things very often, but when they do, sometimes they move them in places you can't necessarily find them easily. The good news is LinkedIn is rolling out a lot more options, both for groups and for personal accounts. And if you have a business, they are also rolling out quite a few more options for business, but that's a topic for another webinar. Now to find how to create a group, you're going to click up in the top right corner under work, and you're gonna have this pop-out menu on the right. So you're gonna select groups and create a new group. So it, in order to start a new group on LinkedIn, it literally takes about, I would say about five minutes or less. Probably the most time you wanna put into creating it is actually writing up what your group is going to be about and your rules and regulations for the group itself. Now you're gonna end up with this pop-up. So you're going to change the, the name itself. You're going to change about this group and you're gonna set some group rules. And you're going to figure out whether you wanna put it standard or unlisted. Now I do know some corporate clubs out there that have used LinkedIn groups successfully and they have them unlisted. So it's only members of their groups themselves that are able to access and find the group. This is going to be entirely up to you. You can change it back and forth. And once you've put in the group name, about, and group rules, these all can be edited at any time. So don't think that once you've started this, it's the end of the world because you can always go back and fix things, especially typos if they happen. Now this is a test group that I started for the new group that I'm forming in Warner, New Hampshire. I don't know whether anybody is going to actually use it or not, but you never know. And I figured for the purposes of this webinar, it would be good to set up one from scratch so you can actually see the process of start to finish, so to speak. Now, when you're doing rules for groups, make sure that you are pretty specific about what you want to put in there. Again, you can go back and edit this later. If you are going to have a group that is going to have a lot of members and they are going to be posting a lot, you are going to have, want to have more than one moderator because having one moderator for a lot of people posting often is too much. I'm a moderator of a whole bunch of groups and in a lot of the bigger groups, I'm, in, I'm a moderator of the Pathways group, for example, on Facebook, and I think we have about 8,000 members. And I think we have nine moderators now, and you really need more than one if it's going to be active, because one person, they get burned out, they don't end up moderating, and basically the group, the group itself falls apart. So you wanna make sure that you have enough people invested in the group itself to be able to keep it running well. Now this is kind of what an actual group looks like. At the moment, there's no content in it. It's very bare bones and it will be until you invite members to it and start the conversation going. You do have the ability to manage the group and managing the group actually gets you back to that box where you can edit the information in it. Now, right now, I'm the only person in it. I'm going to invite some people. So what I would do is invite members. And then all of my contacts that I'm connected to will pop up. In this particular case, I only had one person that I wanted to, or two people that I actually wanted to find and connect with this group because I know that they are going to be members. So you can search connections by name. And when you wanna invite someone, you just check them off. 
and then you hit invite. It's a very easy process to do that. Unfortunately, there is no easy way to invite members outside of LinkedIn into it without actually copying the URL of the LinkedIn group. And I'll get to that in a moment. So this is one of my friends, for example, that is going to be another Toastmasters member for my new group. So I'm going to invite him, for example. Now I can also update settings and I can edit the group information. Now LinkedIn groups has changed quite a bit, I would say in the past eight months. They used to give you a lot more bells and whistles that they seem to have taken away. And I think the reason that they did that was because a lot of the moderators of the groups that have been around for a while basically had too much to do in the groups themselves. So they simplified a lot of things. There's some pros and cons to this. It doesn't let you ask questions anymore, similar to a Facebook group where you can ask people for admittance. Although you can generally tell when people are Toastmasters because if they're on LinkedIn, they usually have it on their LinkedIn profile. They're talking about Toastmasters themselves. Or you can pretty quickly find out what kind of person they are and if they're a Toastmaster or interested in Toastmasters by what they're posting in the group itself. Now you can do settings for your email group. So you can display your group on your own profile, which I highly recommend if you're going to use it to promote the club itself. But when you go into settings, you're also going to see this option, emails for all groups. Just keep in mind, this is not just for your group. If you belong to any other group in, in LinkedIn itself, this will change the settings for all of them. And I know that I used to subscribe to all of those emails anytime I posted something, anytime something was, interest, was of interest in a group that I belong to, and it gets kind of overwhelming. So you wanna be selective about what options you pick in there. Now this is in your own account. This is not just related to the group itself. So anytime you change an option in this, just keep in mind this is all of the groups you belong to and anything else that you are integrated with and you are active on on LinkedIn itself. And I do bring that up because I know someone that recently started their own group for a health and wellness project that they had and they changed their group settings thinking that it was just for the group itself and they ended up being deluged by emails and updates from all of the other groups they belong to. Now does anybody have any quick questions before I move along? Okay. Now if you decide to change these options I would definitely recommend that you do a weekly digest or you can do recommended. And recommended is not what you're recommended, it's what LinkedIn recommends for you. If you are unsure about these options, figure them out, like just play with them a little bit and see what they come in. If you like individually, if you like getting a whole lot of emails in your in inbox, then definitely pick that. But the weekly digest, if you do wanna stay on top of things, is a very good way to do this. Now, editing the group information itself, my apologies, um, also brings you up to a couple of options. But again, it doesn't give you as many bells and whistles as they used to be able to give you in this particular one. Now, I do recommend if you are going to start a group on LinkedIn, make sure you advertise it outside of LinkedIn. So if you have a Facebook page, for example, make sure you post to it and link directly to the group. If you have a Facebook group, for example, which this is also, make sure that you add this as a link to it. And if you have a Toastmasters Club page, whether it's free Toast Host, whether it's WordPress, whether it's any other type of, of uh, page you have out there to advertise the club, make sure you link to your social media. Most people do not search within social media itself for a particular thing. So they won't go to Facebook and look, for example, for Toast on Fire Toastmasters unless they were told to specifically look for it. But they don't use social media necessarily as a search engine to find clubs or businesses. So you really have to people let people know about it. Now, the other big one is if you have people in your club that are on LinkedIn, make sure you email them the LinkedIn URL. That is something very important because a lot of people really don't go on LinkedIn a lot, even if they have LinkedIn accounts. Most of the people that are going to be using your LinkedIn group are going to be heavy LinkedIn users in the first place. 
Now there's kind of a split divide. A lot of people don't like Facebook at all, but they love LinkedIn and vice versa. So you're gonna get different groups of people that are gonna use different groups. You're really going to have to gauge what type of group you have, what the kind of the consensus of the members is in terms of are there a lot of business owners that may use LinkedIn more, for example, than Facebook. But please try not to use both of them unless you have a lot of people that are willing to administrate both. Having one person in charge of a LinkedIn group and a LinkedIn Facebook page, especially, or I'm sorry, a Facebook group, if they are both going to be active is really too much for one person to do. Now, when you start a group for the first time, don't just leave it empty. Make sure you at least post in here something. So if someone comes to this for the first time, if you've invited other people for the first time, maybe they're not even aware of your group, but you want them to be interested because you know that they're local to you and you think they might be interested in perhaps joining Toastmasters, make sure you actually put a teaser in there. Make sure you actually have some content in there instead of it just being blank. Now, best practices for moderating. Now, when you moderate a group, you really have to talk to your club itself about what you want to be the rules and regulations before you even write them. Because you might find people disagreeing in the group itself. And as the moderator or moderators, you're gonna have to decide what is acceptable in the group itself. I found most LinkedIn conversations don't go as much offline as I've seen some of the Facebook group conversations do, but there's still some snarkiness inside. Sometimes there's still some back and forths. There's still some really opinionated people out there that will you know, try to post something just to create a sort of an argumentative environment. You should really talk to the club itself before you start any LinkedIn group or Facebook group and really decide what is acceptable. We wanna to try to stay within Toastmasters best practices. So be polite, be civil, be engaging with people. Um, you do have to remember, especially as the moderator, if you find yourself disagreeing in a conversation, remember to keep the discussion respectful. And LinkedIn really expects all of the members that are participating in the groups to ab abide by LinkedIn professional community policies. Um, one of the other things is whether you're a moderator as a, or a poster, try to really avoid self-promotion. That doesn't go over well. LinkedIn is one of those channels, especially where people hate getting hit over the head by any sales related things. So if you have a group member, for example, that just wrote a book and they wanna promote it, just try to keep that sales self-promotion to a minimum. Um, I have seen a lot of groups that have unmoderators, so there's moderators basically bailed on the groups that are just overrun by spam. And people don't participate in those anymore, and you can really tell they, because when you look at the group's posts, there's not a single comment or a like or anything on any of the posts going back for months and months. They're all promotional things. As the moderator, if you do want a healthy group, after you have people join, you wanna make sure that you contribute to the conversation and not kind of just stand in the background as the moderator and start posting things, you know, post articles of interest, create discussions, create questions, um, invite discussion that people can participate in. So, and ask for members inputs. So if you have something like you're looking for information or you just wanted to start a discussion on, uh, motivational strategies, for example, level two in the path, and you want to talk about one of the electives, which is podcasting, for example, start throwing some things out there that are interesting, perhaps, to the other group members. And this is very much the same if you're going to do a Facebook group as well. And phrase your update as a question. So don't just stay about podcasting. This is very interesting. Ask people what you thought. End it with a question mark. And when you're sharing links or articles, you really wanna state its relevance to the group. You don't wanna just say, Forbes wrote this great article about Toastmasters, add some contribution to it and say, this is why I thought this article was particularly interesting. Because anybody can just go in and post links to things, but actually adding your own spin to it and your own commentary really helps engagement. Now the official Toastmasters International group has an awful lot of members in it. It is fairly active. 
If you are on LinkedIn, I do highly recommend that you join the group and you can find some really useful information in it. There are quite a few other district groups out there, related groups, and there are also some club groups. There are groups out there that are a little bit more difficult to join because they have some things that are necessary, and I'll give you an example in a minute. Now, if you're looking for groups to join, you're not gonna see it right off the bat. You're not going to see it in the top right section, but you might see it if you put Toastmasters in, you'll see people, jobs, content, and if you click down, you're gonna see the more, and this is where you'll find the groups. This is the accredited speakers Toastmasters group, for example, and when you find any group out there that you're not already a member of, you're gonna request to join. In this particular case, Cheryl Rausch, who is a friend of mine, is the admin of this group. So if you were going to perhaps aspire to be an accredited speaker, you might wanna to request to join this, but I do know this particular group is very much dedicated to um, getting accredited speakers, getting them mentors, and helping them answer questions. If you joined this group, for example, and you asked an unrelated question about pathways, for example, that had absolutely nothing to do with accredited speakers, there's a very good chance that Cheryl would probably warn you first, and then if you continue to do it, ask you to leave or just remove you from the group. That does happen in groups that have a lot of good moderators to them. Now, the official International Toastmasters group, um, it used to be when, when you joined, the moderators would actually ask you, similar to the Toastmasters Facebook group, what your member was, member number was. Now, apparently, they look through your, your LinkedIn profile to see any Toastmasters association, or you might get a message, a direct message in your LinkedIn profile from one of the moderators asking you. So, the official Toastmasters forum is very helpful in terms of the fact that you can search in it, which I think is extremely helpful, similar to the Facebook group. So if you're looking for help on pathways, for example, if you're looking for help on getting your DTM under the legacy program, search both groups or search whatever one that you feel is the best fit for what you do personally. Now, how do you use other groups to promote Toastmasters? And this is a question I probably get the most often from people that use LinkedIn. And that is a fantastic question in my eyes, because as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to sell on it. You don't want to spam on it. People don't like getting hit over the head by anything sales related, but you do what's called the soft sell on LinkedIn. And the soft sell is very easy to do. You can promote Toastmasters, you can promote your group, but you have to do it in an indirect and soft way. So if I was going to promote Toastmasters in this particular group, which I'm a member of, first I would join, obviously. And these are some best practices for posting. So this is an indirect way to advertise Toastmasters in general. And I've actually, and I, unfortunately I couldn't find it for the purpose of this particular demonstration, but I've used this technique before to engage people in just Toastmasters conversation in general. So they ask, Toastmasters, we've heard of that, tell us more. Or Toastmasters, isn't that that thing where you go out drinking? Because a lot of people unfortunately still don't quite get Toastmasters. This is an indirect way to advertise Toastmasters. You're not directly promoting it and you're trying to engage people in conversation. This is one of the best ways to kind of indirectly leverage other forums. So I'm gonna give you a second to kind of just read through that one. Now here's another one. This one is a little bit more blatant, but not directly promoting your club, but it is promoting Toastmasters. And that's part of the whole way to get people involved in conversation. Because when you're leveraging Toastmasters and leveraging kind of getting the word out there, the chances of you being in a forum with someone else being in a forum 
the same forum that's within 20 miles of you or even 50 miles of you is slim to none. So when you're leveraging this, you're promoting Toastmasters in general. You're not necessarily promoting, promoting the club. And you do have to keep that in mind because most of the people that are in the entrepreneur group, for example, and I actually did a study, a brief study of the 50,000 members that are in it, I would say probably about 25 of them or so are in New Hampshire where I now live. And a couple of them are already Toastmasters. So my odds of kind of, you know, reaching out and hitting with a dart, those people interested in joining my club in Warner, New Hampshire is pretty slim to none. But it is a great way to engage with people and it is a great way to connect with other people on LinkedIn and get the word about Toastmasters out there. So this is a little bit more of a direct pitch for Toastmasters, but it also can invite conversation with people. This is one that I would definitely stay away from for a couple of reasons. As I just mentioned, the odds of hitting people in that direct area is very, very slim, but it's also a blatant sales pitch. And in some forums, that's fine. They're overrun by those, but you also have to keep in mind the ones that are overrun by those, nobody's actually reading them except for the ones posting them. So try to stay away from that direct thing unless it's specifically showing somebody so, something. So say I wrote a post on our blog, for example, that was talking about how Toastmasters can help managers become better managers by helping them give better feedback to their employees. That is something worthy of posting and it might be connected to my club page. And who knows, there could be somebody in the Warner, New Hampshire area that would read that and say, hey, that's a great blog post. I'm interested in joining. But again, it's more about just getting the word out about Toastmasters in general, getting connections on LinkedIn, and basically getting the word out there. Now, you can also use this not just by posting directly, by adding comments to relevant forums that are out there. So answering questions is a great way, again, to in, get engagement with people. So this particular topic, for example, is in one of the SCORE forums. And SCORE is uh, small business mentoring, similar to Toastmasters. And they're talking about what speaker topics are popular at women's events. So if I was going to comment on this, for example, again, I would not be salesy, but I would talk about a past experience that I had in Toastmasters and make sure that you mention this. Um, again, when I've added this into comments and conversations, people always say, oh, yes, Toastmasters. And then you can get into a conversation about Toastmasters itself. Now, why do this? Because if nobody that is in the forum is that going to be in your region? You don't know who they're connected with. So this fundraising chair, for example, is connected to about 1,500 people, which is, in essence, a lot of people that might be in the area that I'm in. So you're doing the you know, six degrees of separation or the seven degrees of separation where Sally, for example, probably is not, well, I know for a fact she's not in Warner, New Hampshire, but some of her connections might be in the area of New Hampshire that might be interested in the club. And if I engage with her or I engage with some of the other people on this forum, there's a good chance that she might say, hey, you know, I had this great conversation with someone on LinkedIn and they might start talking about Toastmasters, the topic of the club might come up. You never know who people are connected to. And it's also good just for making business connections. So if you take Toastmasters out of the picture, it's a good way, again, just to network. Now, when you're moderating a forum or you're participating in a forum, when someone's posted something, there's two different things that you can do besides liking and commenting on it. You can save the article for later. So if they posted a great blog post to, someone, to something else, or they posted that Forbes article about Toastmasters, and you didn't have time to read it right now because you were on the run on the way to the doctor's office, you can save the article for later reading. Or if you didn't feel this post was appropriate, for example, or they were getting aggressive with someone, you can also report it. It's not just on main posts, but it's like Facebook where you can report comments to the moderators themselves. So that's useful. I've actually never come across a group where people have reported the post for being offensive, but I have come a lot of, across a lot of posts and forums where people have reported the post for being too salesy, especially when the group moderators have specified this is not a sales pitch group. Okay. Now, in order to save those articles, you're going to want to go up here 
to the little icon on the left, and you'll see here your saved articles. Now, the thing to remember about LinkedIn, and this holds true for most other social media channels, if you ever get lost on where you are, the icon on the top left will always bring you back to home base. This is actually true in Basecamp in Toastmasters. So in Cornerstone On Demand, which is our pathways format for getting into our uh, learning program, if you click on the icon on the top left, it will again, always bring you back to home base. One of the other ways that you can leverage Toastmasters is make sure on your own profile, put it under your accomplishments. If you volunteered for something, if you've been on someone's campaign committee, for example, if you were the VPE, if you were the president, if you were an area director, list all of the things that you've done and list the things that are related to it in Toastmasters itself. I do see people saying they have a CC or an ACB. I have not yet seen anybody do their levels in LinkedIn, but you never know. That one is entirely up to you. Um, they do say it doesn't hurt to do it in search. I, I know that some people that are looking for other Toastmasters actually type in in the top bar, they'll, they'll type in DTM to look for other DTMs to network with. That one is entirely up to you whether you wanna put that in your profile name itself. Uh, it doesn't hurt to do it, but definitely if you've done anything Toastmasters related, put that in your accomplishments. Even if you've never been an officer, even if you've just been a club member or a new club member, put that in there, the fact that you belong to a Toastmasters club. It just helps get the word out about Toastmasters in general. Now commenting on just your internal feed. So when you're on LinkedIn itself, and you're not in a group, you're gonna have a feed right in the middle of the page, just like your Facebook feed, or just like a Twitter feed, or just like Instagram or Pinterest, actually, they're all laid out very similarly. Now you can search for Toastmasters related or, uh, post as well, and you'll actually see people that you're not even connected with. So this particular person is actually a third degree connection. I'm not connected with them directly, but I can see that they're posting something about Toastmasters. And when I do this, I can also do some engagement with this post if I choose to. So I can like it, I can comment it, and more importantly, I can share it. So similar to posting in a group itself, you can leverage other people's posts on your own Toastmasters LinkedIn profile. So if you have someone uh, share that post about Forbes Toastmasters article, for example, you can share that onto your own profile page and it will show up in the main feed to a lot of other people when they're searching for public speaking, they're searching for Forbes, they're searching for a bunch of other things related to that. And then they can comment, they can also share that as well. Sharing these, commenting on them, liking them all help with engagement on LinkedIn in general. And also finding things that are related to your district. So this is my old new, <laughs> I guess I'm a dual, dual district member now, um, but this is our district director elect for District 53. And you can also comment on this and the same thing. You can share with them, you can engage with them. Engagement is really what helps grow the Toastmasters name and also can help promote your club however indirectly it might be. Okay, now does anybody have any questions? I know that we have another half an hour or so, but I could bore you to death about the little minute of setting up a LinkedIn group, but there really isn't any of those anymore. Okay, so the question is, how do we report inappropriate content spam when I see it? Well, when someone has posted something, there's always going to be those three little dots. And when you do that, that pull down right there, you're going to see re report a post. When you're the moderator of a group, you'll actually see that show up in your notifications. You'll see someone has reported a post. And at that point, you can decide what to do with it. You can approve it, you can delete it, um, you can boot the member, if, especially if they, they completely do it very many times. But you generally wanna try to give that person a warning first, especially if they're a Toastmaster and their other posts have been uh, like they've been contributing to the group in general. Okay, and the next question is, can I delete a conversation or a post? Yes, you can absolutely delete a conversation or a post. Um, you can edit it as well. You cannot delete someone else's post unless you are the moderator. Um, so if you were on someone's regular feed or you were on another group, 
that you were not the moderator of, you could only report it. You could not delete that post, but you de definitely can delete your own posts. Okay, one of the other things that's very important when you create any type of group, when it's Facebook group or a LinkedIn group, is have a goal. What do you want to do with the group itself? Is it going to be to help promote your group? Is it going to be for anybody to join that's a Toastmaster and have Toastmaster related conversations? Is it just going to be for your members to join? And if it's just going to be for your members to join, what do you want to achieve with it? Do you want to be sharing updates about when the group meets? Do you want to be sharing issues? Do you want to uh, you know, just talk about Toastmasters things in general? Do you want to be a, a help-based forum? Really think when you create a forum, what are your aims and goals behind that? And there was a next question, do you have a handout that could guide us in wording a good post? You know, I do not have necessarily a handout, but I can certainly work something up for people if, there, if anyone is interested in that. And I can certainly go back and kind of show you best practices. So this is kind of best practices for indirect non-salesy. You're bringing up Toastmasters, you're talking about something that happened, a, a past experience. You just want to stay away from a direct sales pitch. And again, it's not necessarily going to do you any good because of the relative, non-relative uh, people that are going to be able to go from Michigan, for example, to my Warner New Hampshire club. So the distance thing is a big one. So I'd be happy to, to write up some wording for that. Um, and I can make it certainly Toastmasters related. Um, but yes, thank you for that question. That's a good one. Um, there's a question here when we're sharing content from other sites, should we be sharing the whole article? Should we just be sharing the URL? How do we share things appropriately? Okay, if I was going to share the Forbes article, for example, and actually this is the next slide, the best practices is actually um, to put in the title of it and put in the link and then put in a short blurb about it. So you can share maybe one or two sentences that really stood out from you. What you want, don't want to do is copy the whole article and paste it in there. Um, there is, a, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, there is a character count limit in posts, but that's also violating copyright and you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you give people proper attribution for this. Okay. Now, what kind of conversations, this is a great question, what kind of conversations would be most useful to members of the group itself? And I would say probably the most useful are things that get asked a lot. So if you're the VPE of your club, for example, one of the questions you might get asked a lot is, I'm stuck in base camp, I can't proceed from my icebreaker to the next project. So you could start to post questions that you might get a lot for club members. How do I sign up for the agenda and free toast host too, for example? If anybody's an officer, and even for a year, they'll get to start to know some of the questions that they get often from people. Okay, and the next question is, love some handout information. I deal with tremors, so it's hard for me to write notes. Loving what you're sharing, thank you. Um, any ideas how to use it for a new division director? I think there is some division LinkedIn groups out there. I would actually have to look. Um, in terms of using it for a new division director, I think probably your best way to kind of suss that one out is start talking to your area directors and also start reaching out to the clubs and finding out how many of your members use LinkedIn versus using Facebook. It might be both. Um, I mean, I do know in terms of you know a division director, you know, outsourcing information just to their area directors, you could use it like that. Uh, it depends on how responsive your area directors are and how many of them are using LinkedIn and how many of them are using Facebook. Um, I know that when I was a division director, I used Google Sheets a lot and we had spreadsheets so that we could actually check things off. That's the kind of thing that you could probably tie into one of those groups and have everybody be able to edit things. So you could know who is trained for officers, for example. You could know which club needed help. That's probably the kind of things that you would share, I would say, in a closed Facebook group versus a LinkedIn group because a lot of this stuff can be public and some of that information you may not necessarily want out there. Okay. 
Now, does anybody have any other questions about LinkedIn? I'd be happy to answer. Uh, again, LinkedIn groups for clubs may not necessarily be the way to go, but if you do have a very tech-oriented group or you do have a corporate club, for example, it might be the perfect option and the perfect alternative to using a Facebook group. I know a lot of people out there don't like Facebook anymore. Okay. If you do have any questions after this, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, in your registration, that registration link you got for the District 53 Gmail actually goes to me. So if you think of anything after the fact that you'd like to know about LinkedIn and I didn't answer the question now, please reach out and email me and I'd be more than happy to share what I know. Or if I don't know, I will certainly look it up for you. Okay. So thank you everybody for attending. Very much appreciated, and I hope everybody has a great rest of their evening and a terrific weekend. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye.